Our reading today is from Mark chapter 10, 17 to 21, and it includes what we read last week and then continues. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honour your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were great, greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields, with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. May the Lord add his blessing to these readings of his holy word. God, as we delve into your word today, we ask that you might help us to hear what it is that your spirit is calling to us. And in hearing, to respond in grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you know the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything? It is, of course, 42. The answer given by the computer deep thought after 7.5 million years of calculation it is a bit of an insider's joke if you've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. And there is an entire subgroup of people who, if asked for the meaning of life, will immediately answer with 42. When challenged on the answer, deep thought replies that to understand the answer, you need to know the question. I find myself wondering if it is this confusion over what people want and why they want it that leads to so much of the shock and perplexity in our reading today. Jesus tells the young man that he lacks one thing. I can well imagine the young man's ears pricking up and him thinking, to paraphrase the words of Edmund Hillary, finally I'm going to knock the off. In a way it almost looks like a bit of a bucket list. Let's see, I have $100 billion, I own an electric car company, I own a space company. What's next on my list of to-dos? I am poking fun at Elon Musk because he's an easy target. But you can see similar things going on wherever there is plenty of money. Right, I've solved the issues of making money. Maybe I'd better attend to my future self. I wonder what it will cost to get to heaven. Then Jesus goes on to highlight the need to deal with that wealth. And not just some of it. We're not talking about becoming a socialite philanthropist, lauded far and wide for giving to the arts and whatever issues of the moment will keep you in the spotlight. No, this is everything. Every last little bit. 
gone. There's no coming back from this. At least not as far as this particular hoard is concerned. It's no wonder the young man is shocked and grieved. This goes beyond life changing. It's going to require a total change in perspective, a complete rewrite of how to live. His friends and relationships will change. His ability to do just about everything he is familiar with will be gone. Now, here's the thing. The young man came with a question that he didn't truly understand. We don't know exactly how he came to ask the question of Jesus, but it is clear it has been nagging him for some time. It's possible, indeed likely, it is a question that's been echoed among the people he spends time with. Perhaps in the synagogue or temple, depending on where he worships. It may be an intellectual exercise with some of his educated friends, or it might be that he looked up at the stars and wondered. But however he came by the question, it's clear that he spent little time pondering the implications of the question, let alone the implications of the answer. I would suggest, for the most part, We're very similar to the young man and to the disciples in that we've spent little time thinking about the whys and hows of eternal life. Exactly what is eternal life? What does it mean to enter the kingdom of God? Why is it so hard to enter the kingdom of God? We read the story, we nod sagely, then press on to the next story before we get bogged down in the details. After all, you don't need to know the principles of the combustion engine to drive a car. Why would you need to know the principles of eternal life in order to receive it? I suspect that some of this is because we are wired to filter out much of what goes on around us. A little like someone who lives beside the railroad and barely notices the trains rumbling by. They've learnt to filter those sounds out. We have learnt to filter out anything that doesn't seem to directly impinge on our health, safety and general direction of life. It takes an effort, often significant effort, to step out of our daily way of life and think about how we are and why we are. It's why most of us default to letting the minister to do the theology during the week and then regurgitate it to us in easily swallowed lumps on Sunday. The looks I get, should I be silly enough to suggest doing theology together, are often not far short of, well, death threats. Theology is your job, and would you kindly keep it well hidden from our daily lives? I say this with a sense of humour and a level of sadness. The young man, in coming to Jesus with his question, had become aware that something was trying to get through his filter. He couldn't identify that something and decided to get some help. The problem he faced was that identifying what was wrong then required a decision to be made. For a successful business leader such as himself, he likely assumed it would be simple to decide once he had a solution in front of him. What he didn't take into account was that the solution would be so intimately connected to how he understood himself as a person. His entire self-identity had been built around being successful, being wealthy, Every choice he had made to this point revolved around this perception of success. The solution Jesus offered required giving up that very thing that defined his self-understanding. It's a little like suddenly realizing that the train that has passed by every day for the past 20 years is really, really loud. This is partly why the disciples were perplexed and astounded at Jesus' answer. They were suddenly hearing the train roaring past them as well. They get that this is not just about having money. Riches come in many forms. Yes, rich with money, but how about rich in family, rich in friends, in experience, in talent? You get the picture. Their question, then who can be saved, tells us they see this as so much bigger than some rich guy wanting to get into heaven. And so we come to the real point of what Jesus is talking about. You can't do it. You do not have the resources required to enter eternal life. It's impossible for mortals to enter eternal life under their own steam. 
In my imagination, I can see the disciples standing there with their mouths hanging open like fish suddenly out of water. The train hasn't just passed by, it's hit them head on. Up until now, everything they've been doing with Jesus has really been something of a game. Say yes to Jesus, follow him around. If everything turns to custard, we can always go back to what we were doing before. In fact, that is exactly what they did after Jesus was crucified. Where did Jesus find them? Out fishing, back doing what they had always done. But Jesus is saying they have to give that up and give it up in such a way that short of God's intervention, there is no going back. The truth is that with very few exceptions, we can't do that. It's not that we don't understand the idea or even want to follow up on it. It's that we have neither the strength nor the courage to follow through. That's not a condemnation, merely an observation. We simply don't have it within ourselves to follow through on what God is calling us into. We will try. We will fail. We try again. In some cases, we keep on trying with great faithfulness and we keep on failing. Whatever our wealth happens to be will keep getting in the way. Even if we find the courage to give up our wealth, it will only be a matter of time before we find something or someone or somewhere else to place our trust. But here's the thing. God gets it. God gets us. God knows us. God loves us even in our inability to enter the kingdom of our own accord. Now I know that there are plenty of people who happily say, it's okay, God's got this. While it's true, I think it often misses the astonishment of the disciples. They understand the extremity of what Jesus is saying. It doesn't matter if camels are passing through small gates or the literal eye of a needle. They have been faced with the fact that unless God intervenes, they're not getting eternal life. Unless God intervenes, we are not getting eternal life. Okay, point made, so what? Here's what I think we need to take away from this. We spend a large portion of our lives filtering God out. It's like we know there is a missing piece to life, and as long as it's not too obvious, we're happy to keep it that way. We like who we are and how we do things. For the most part, at least. Letting God in gets in the way of all of that. It means that when God gently whispers to us, encouraging us to grow a little, become a little more like Jesus, we're just as likely to ignore those whispers or talk louder to drown them out. It means that we begin to think that our way of doing things is better, that we're in control of our lives. We don't murder or steal or commit adultery and in that, we think we're okay. I'm a good person. I'm going to heaven. And so we filter God out. The sense of something missing is buried beneath all the things we like doing and being. I want to ask you this morning, are you okay with filtering God out? If so, I actually think that's okay. You are still loved. If you're not okay with filtering God out, then ask yourself, what are you going to do about it? We pray. God, rich in mercy, full of grace, abounding in love. We come to you in so very many states, filled with hope, expectation, fear, concern, indifference. We long for you to intervene in our lives and we're afraid that you will intervene in our lives. We search for answers and simultaneously dread those answers. You know our hearts. Come to us today as we have need and reveal yourself to us out of and beyond our filters. Let us see you. Amen.